Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Purang dhammang sanghang namasami So Longpur Cha said that without understanding death, life can be very confusing. And I like to lead that guided death meditation a few times every year, just because recollection of, of death lets us winnow the chaff from the grain of our life. It lets us see what is meaningful and not meaningful. And more and more as one practices, the metrics of good and evil become a bit too coarse for our own behavior, but the language of trivial and non-trivial become very relevant. And these moments to look and see in the scope of our work and relationship and day-to-day, -day, what feels trivial? what feels like a waste and what feels truly worthy of, of our death, what, is, what feels like it has the weight to be worthy of that core of, of our lives. And it's interesting because sometimes we look back after a year and, and understand that something shifted under the surface of the job or the relationship or just our daily routine where our hearts in a different place, there's a different melody running through us, but our external behavior is the same. And that discord becomes viscerally apparent. It's almost an embodied sense of I'm wasting my time and to understand that and honor that part of us that knows deep down that a well-adjusted middle-class existence is a cheap goal for a life. It doesn't mean that can't be part of a life. It doesn't mean it can't be the path. But the goal is always liberation and a purity of heart and an acknowledgement of a world that deeply needs uh, people who are deepening and broadening and caring for their hearts so that they can care for others. This is our duty and our purpose. And to remind ourselves of that because we so easily get lost and forget and the Netflix subscription's still there and there's the new Marvel movie, maybe. Don't know if those are still coming out. I think they probably are. Not allowed to watch them. <laughs> and I remember my dad coming back from Thailand the first time he visited me, and he was just washing some dishes at the sink, and he said, suddenly the thought came up to me, like, what would I be willing to give up to be happy? And we all know that question, and we know we aren't answering it completely satisfactorily. At least most of us aren't. I'm not, always. So what would it take to align our lives completely? And there's a special alchemy to the Four Noble Truths. Most of you will know these. This is the basic framework for the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha had two categorical teachings that were always relevant, and it's the Four Noble Truths and the Four Right Efforts. So the Four Noble Truths are best looked at as tasks, or as Ajahn Kovilo said last week, the Four Noble Shoulds, or Moves. So one is meant to comprehend dukkha, suffering or stress. One is to let go of its cause, craving, thirst, tanha. One is to realize the cessation of dukkha, nibbana, peace. 
And one is to develop the path to that cessation or peace, the Noble Eightfold Path. Right intention, or right view, right intention, right speech, and so on, up to right concentration. And something we begin to understand is that first noble truth is first for a reason. I mean, first the four are ordered in the order that Ayurvedic medicine was ordered. The diagnosis, the cause, the course of treatment. Um, and yet also, the first noble truth is always what we're running from, constantly trying to turn away from dukkha, from suffering. And to clarify that there are two kinds of dukkha, this semantic point always gets kind of stuck with people. There's the dukkha of the three characteristics of existence, change, uh, not self, and, uh, and dukkha. So basically the fact that all things are changing and this is just a fast fact of existence and existence an arahant, an enlightened being will experience this dukkha. And we can coexist with that type of dukkha with grace and it can be poignant and the world can be beautiful. But the second level of dukkha, which the Buddha compared to the second arrow we just shoot ourselves with, he said it's like you're someone has been shot by an arrow, and then they get shot by a second arrow, and that second arrow is the second layer of dukkha. And this is the dukkha of the Four Noble Truths that is caused by thirst, by craving. This is the ugly that we lay on top of what does not have to be ugly. It's when a slight grump, you know, slight, you know, not in the best mood turns into real aversion, when liking something turns to greed, it's hatred, it's, it's getting drunk on a world intoxicating yet not worth becoming intoxicated by because over time we know the hangover too well. This is the dukkha we let go of. And the first noble truth, because we're always turning from this movement obscures dukkha, and you can really try it. If you just try not to move while you sit for a certain length of time, you'll feel suffering. And if you don't constantly distract yourself, you also will feel suffering. And to see that so much of our life is this constant running and that the key pivot in a life, in a spiritual life, is to turn towards that suffering to lay careful hands on it, to stop looking at it as something to be run from and to look at it as something to be understood, comprehended, because it, because it is through that comprehension that we let go of the craving, that we understand, and that we find a path to peace. And it's so counterintuitive because we have no trouble looking at the bright parts of our life you know, I've quoted often the Ajahn Punadamo quote where he says, people are so unfair to us Buddhists, they say, all you talk about is suffering, but it's not true. We also talk about sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. But the reason we talk about suffering is because people don't often need help t looking to the brightness in their life. What they need help with is turning towards the bruise. And... There's a teacher, Frank Ostaseski, who was teaching this in Idaho, and someone raised their hand in the audience and said, oh, the first noble truth, it's like, it's like telephone poles. And Frank said, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? And he said, no, I used to work installing telephone poles. And the foreman said, if this starts to fall, which way do you run? And... I said, well, you, you run away. And he said, no, you run right up to the pole and put your hands on it because that way you get to know which way it's falling. Right next to the pole is the safest place to be. And who here has seen my octopus teacher? Yeah, okay, I'm allowed to watch documentaries. So I did, my parents showed me that one. And uh, the, uh, there's that one scene where the octopus jumps on the shark's back 
and it, it just can't find it because it's the octopus is on its back. <laughs> so to be right next to suffering and to comprehend and this is how we can move past it. And ironically, when we stop walling ourselves off from that dark aspect of the light of our lives, the bright aspects open up too. We don't get to selectively set up a wall. When we shut out dukkha, we shut out the brightness too. Jung said, that which we do not acknowledge becomes our destiny, and the shadow is what we do not look to. In Transcendent Dependent Origination, the Buddha said that suffering can lead either to, oh no, actually in a different sutta, sorry. The Buddha said that suffering leads either be to bewilderment or to a search. And we all know that moment in our lives where the darkness didn't lead to more running or searching, but rather to an intuition of something, there has to be something else. And maybe we were lucky enough then, or maybe a few years later, to come across this gentle glow of some way forward, which is the path of practice. And the problem is once you've started down that road, you can't turn away. There was a, a teacher who welcomed everyone to his first Dhamma talk by saying, all right, you all probably should leave right now because once you hear this, you don't get to go back. I think it was tongue in cheek, but it's true. Once you've started to see this, you can never totally put it away again. Ajahn Panyavado compared dukkha, or sorry, dhamma, to kind of a ping pong ball submersed in water and it keeps popping up. And dukkha is us constantly trying to keep it down. And once you've begun to see that that's what you're doing, then something in you no longer gets to compromise. And I remember, you know, in college, I lived a pretty good life. I was meditating. Things were pretty good. But there was this all, always this slight sense of just being a little off. It's like the compass needle is aligned slightly different to true north. And you know you're living a life not worthy of your death. You know, the tragedy of modern life is not often these deep breaks, but rather a steady dissolution of purpose in inconvenience and distraction. And yet that is truly still tragic, and we know it. Deep down, we know this. And so this understanding of how deeply we turn towards that first noble truth how willing we are to look towards our own and others' imperfections to be with that. And often it's not this dramatic shift towards something we've been ignoring. For many of us, it's just a willingness to sit still with this slight imperfection that we see in us ourselves, or the slight discomfort, or the moment of failure, or the moment of feeling left out. And instead of reacting to trace that back to its root of insecurity of the, deeper, of the deeper dukkha which lies below. And to know that if you hold still through that, through that kind of dark night of the soul, through that dark valley, that you let go of tanha, you let that kind of screaming part of you that wants to jump into the conversation you're feeling left out of, that wants to vent the anger you're feeling, that wants to dive into and buy into the jealousy that you've been nurturing. And if you let it pass and fade, then you find on the other side there's a sense of peace. There's the third noble truth waiting. And this is the alchemy of the Four Noble Truths. This is grace. This is a Buddhist conception of grace. You know, what, what does that word mean? I think it's the most beautiful word in the English language. It can refer to the movement of a dancer. It can refer to a moment of grace that's 
given to us as guidance. It can refer to a moment when we've found ourselves on our knees and then find that we can finally stand again. And to forgiveness and to redemption. And for me, all those intonations of that word, all those implications, the common thread is a trust in a deeper song, a trust in something else and a surrendering to something beyond our conceptual mind, beyond the cheap and shallow metrics which we usually apply and overlay onto our lives. And a trust that if we do hold still through the inner tenter, ten, temper tantrum, if we do turn towards counterintuitively what we've been running from, that there's peace on the other side. And I find it so beautiful when, beautiful when this manifests in ways that are clear. There was a man I knew he uh, escaped from Bosnia during, um, from Sarajevo during the siege in the back of a truck and he lived with us when I was a kid for several years. And his first child, he went through all this tragedy and his first child was born with um, Down syndrome. And it was a hard year when they found out their child would have this, this difficulty. And then I met him five or six years later and his daughter, he said that he felt like she'd been given to him to teach him how to love because they were the most beautiful pair of beings I've almost ever met together. Just this lovely little girl and this man who'd been given this pure way of loving another human being and there was no way of looking at them and thinking that that grace does not exist, that there's some deeper mystery, we might call it Dhamma, that we can have faith in even when the kind of shallow metrics of our lives don't, don't validate or don't make sense of. And so often we measure our life on this X, Y axis of success and failure. And it's so important to note that when you start to practice it opens up this Z axis and you begin to move through this whole strata that's different. And everything in your life can look the same. It can still be the same middle class existence. It can still be the same relationship. But something is changing profoundly in us. We're looking at it from a whole different place. You know, I'm reminded of someone um, in this community who just said he'd started making a practice of closing every cabinet in his kitchen as quietly as he possibly could every day of doing everything as quietly as he could. And what would that mean to have the same life, the same relationships, the same job, but to make it into a work of art where every action was infused with presence, with care, with beauty? That's what this path opens up to us. We don't have to make any huge changes. Your life, I was going to say your life is just fine as it is. It might be. Um, there's a teacher who said, you're perfect as you are, and there's some room for improvement. So can you hold both those truths? Can you understand the change in your life might not be from the radical shift, from quitting the job, from breaking up, from getting a new relationship? It might be the starting point is just closing the cabinets more quietly, meditating, getting that ballast of mindfulness every, every day making your life into a work of art. And that if you do this, the pure heart is the greatest gift you can give to the world. There's no divergence between the greatest good you can do for yourself and the greatest good you can do for the world. The world needs purity and beauty and selflessness, and that's where this path leads. And often what it takes to move from that first to that third noble truth, to get through that suffering, to find peace on the other side. You know, the Buddha said that patient endurance was the supreme incinerator of defilement. So it's not that romantic. It's just like patience, patience. 
And that's very helpful because sometimes what's happening to us, what's shaping us is occurring at a higher level than what we can conceive. And to have the patience and care to hold still through that, so often right effort is just holding still, holding still and letting something new manifest slowly. Um, and yet also, sometimes if we really can change that language to gratitude, to not look at suffering as this thing we have to kind of always just work with and bear with until it goes away, but rather how much can we turn towards and really value that? I spoke about this last week where the Mahayana believe that bodhisattvas will split off part of their minds and send it down as the difficult boss, the drunk on the side of the road, or the difficult partner to help us build these qualities of love, of care, of patience. And can we show and feel gratitude for that in our lives, which is not perfect? Because without that, we would be careless and we'd have nothing to... We, there would be no friction to draw the brightness of the heart away from the cloth of conditioned reality and to look for a deeper refuge. So can you really turn towards these people as, as your teachers, these difficult situations? And I always find one interesting way of just looking at, I've never seen a limit to how deep that alchemy goes, how deeply you turn towards that first noble truth to comprehend it. Um, if you read the Gulag Archipelago with Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Russian prison camps and how he was able to find purpose there in the midst of suffering. Or Monk Mose, who uh, was this Christian monk who existed in Russian prisons in the middle of the, uh, the 20th century. And he went and he expected to find these broken men. And what he found was these, the monks who had been kept in this prison for decades, they'd conceived of it as this chance to purify their own hearts, to take on the burdens of the world for the sake of purifying. And what does it mean to really turn towards our greatest difficulty as a chance to deepen? And I think this is why we really can look at the Four Noble Truths, you know, it's almost like fusion, where you find that point of suffering. And you really see this play out in meditation. When things get calm, you'll find that the mind and the body will throw up kinds of knots somewhere in the body. Each, each thought has a physical manifestation of a point of tension. And often that'll manifest in the head. And the temptation is to go elsewhere, to place your awareness somewhere else. And to know that often what you need to do, it's like trigger points with uh, massage, where you find the knot and you press it really hard with your thumb. And then it releases and there's a, this relaxing. And so often meditation, you'll find that if you go to that point of tension and kind of let awareness crystallize around it, and release. It'll release into the spacious, broad awareness. And similarly with kind of just the normal breath meditation, you might find the mind narrows down to this pinpoint of the breath and holds for a time and then releases back out into light. And this process of fusion where when you allow the mind to go and touch dukkha, when you allow the mind and heart to touch that and release it, it releases into light. It's like how, you know, the sun, the center of gravity is where this, this fusion's occurring. And then once it's happened, um, what expands out is, is light. And so if we're truly able to look at the difficulty in 
existence in, in our lives, at the places where things most are most challenging, then what we find is when that releases, there's a sense of luminosity, of light, of spaciousness. And, you know, one of the most interesting places this manifests for people is in the fear of praise and blame, of being left out, of validation. And to really watch just that thread of measuring ourselves against others, against the criteria we'd want for, you know, we've set for our own lives and careers and relationship. And to watch how when you see others having fun or when you see people not looking at you as you want to be looked at, just that sense of surging indignation or craving, reactivity, wanting to jump in. And if you just hold still through that, how what emerges on the other side is this quiet majesty and, and that this is grace. Um, these are the Four Noble Truths manifest. And when the Buddha talked about the enlightened mind, the analogy, the simile he gave us was light that lands on nothing. And it's such a perfect, perfect simile. Because the paradigm for spiritual practice at the time was heat, tapas, spiritual heat. So it was the energy of fire clinging to something bound in a location, hot, burning, agitated turning to ash and this movement in the Buddhist path from that to the energy of light, radiant, cool, spacious. And there's a sutta where the Buddha says, if there's a hut with a window facing east and the light comes in and falls on the wall, or where does it fall? And the monk says, well, it falls on the wall. And he says, if there's no wall, where does it fall? And he says, it lands on the earth. And he says, if there's no earth, where does it land? And the monk says it lands on the water. And he says, there's no water. Where does it land? And he says, it lands, it lands nowhere. And the Buddha says, even so, consciousness, or this is the enlightened mind that lands on no surface. And there's a famous sutta where Vachagota asks the Buddha, when a Tathagata, the enlightened being, passes away, where do they go? And the Buddha says, this does not apply. And Vajagota says, what do you mean it doesn't apply? Or does a Tathagata, Tathagata exist, not exist, both exist and not exist, and neither exist nor not, not, not exist? We call that the quadrilemma. You just really cover all of your bases. And the Buddha says, all those don't apply, which is pretty confusing. And, and Vajagota says, that's pretty confusing. And the Buddha says, it's like this flame. If this flame goes out, would you say this flame burns dependent on fuel? And Vachagota says, yes. And he says, when the flame goes out, does it go north, south, east, or west? And Vachagota says, none of these apply. Uh, the flame is simply reckoned as extinguished. And the Buddha says, even so, that form by which one could categorize or label the Tathagata, the Buddha, the enlightened mind, has been cut off at the root, made like a palm tree stump, deprived of the conditioned conditions for future arising. That feeling, that perception, that sankara, that consciousness by which the Tathagata might be reckoned and measured has been cut off at the root, made like a palm tree stump, deprived of conditioned conditions for fu future becoming. The Tathagata is deep, immeasurable, profound like the ocean. So you see what he does there. First, he destroys every categorization, categorization which you might hold the enlightened mind in a conceptual framework. But then he uses the simile of the ocean to show that it's not nothing. It's not nothing. The nibbana element is not nothing. And it's interesting because we do have this 
proclivity coming from Western cultures in Northern European context that a, a fire going out equals cold, void, death. But in the Ganges River Valley, it was really hot. And a fire going out was not necessarily bad. And there was the concept of a fire element named Agi. It was almost conceived of as a god which pervaded all things. And this is light that lands on nothing. The enlightened mind is beyond conceiving. But this metric of light is so good because people miss the light nimitta in their meditations a lot because they're expecting a ball of light. But what they don't see is that their meditations are slowly, the entire field of vision is becoming brighter. And even so, people can miss the change in their life because they're looking for one manifestation, a peak experience, something they can point to. But what it really might be is that your whole life is just becoming brighter. There's more gratitude. These little changes. Someone is noting this morning that this is the first time they haven't been worried about their birthday party. That's a metric. <laughs> and, um, and the thing about light is, you know, according to general relativity, all things are moving through space-time at the speed of light. So when something moves through space, it moves through time more slowly. And so a, a ray of light, it moves at the speed of light, so it never moves through time. It's timeless. And what a perfect analogy for the enlightened mind. Light that lands on nothing. So just to say people, uh, just to encourage people to look towards this kind of luminosity, to know that you don't get there just by always looking to the bright, but that there is this dark valley, but that also there's grace and refuge and a community to hold us as we move through those different strata of experience. Satu, 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 anumultami. So we have time for some questions or discussion. If people have anything they'd like to talk about, just raise your hand and Miles will run the mic over to you. If you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I love that metaphor of the telephone poles and putting your hands on it. That piece is um, just really wonderful. And I was just thinking about what that looks like in day-to-day -day life as you're facing suffering, uh, to put your hands on it like that and, and to run towards it. Um, and I was just thinking, I think sitting meditation um, is, is something that I've used to do that, to just, okay, I'm gonna just be with this and look at it closely. Um, but if you have any other thoughts about what it looks like, that metaphor, and then what it looks like in day-to-day -day life, I'd love to hear. A great, great question. And I think you're right, a lot of the time, it's not this dramatic, turning towards some trauma we've been blocking out our whole lives. It's, it's just the simple act of sitting for 30 minutes every morning and letting the discomforts or the failure of yesterday come up and being willing to be with that in quiet. But I, I would also say that there's a way we run from things. Um, I think often that has to do with aversion. Um, and what comes to mind is you know, those people, usually we all have kind of a list of the people we sort of circle through and have an internal argument with, you know, and, and often they're the people most precious to us, you know, who inevitably those are also generally the people who our self is most entangled with, so it makes sense. But, but I find we can kind of, you know, fusion requires you to go to the center and you can avoid a fusion reaction by orbiting quite a lot. So how we kind of find that argument or that person and just kind of orbit quietly around for a few years or decades and hash over the same arguments again. And with something like that, I think 
there can be a real need to turn very intentionally steer into the atmosphere. I'm mixing metaphors now. Sun does have an atmosphere, I think. <laughs> Small. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and to really, like, actually, inve if the Buddha said there are some defilements which can be let go of just by seeing them. But for some of these ones, there's a laziness where we just are like, okay, I'm angry again, but the, the splinter's still there. And to be willing to get in there with the tweezers and pull it out. So like, okay, you know, and all the means the Buddha gave to do that. So looking to the good in someone, um, really seeing, you know, a negative thought, what are the positive elements that can't contradict that? Um, how do we extricate that splinter? And for me, that actually is a way of turning towards suffering because the gentle or the uh, repeated kind of orbiting around but not really investigating is a way of avoiding as well. So that's just one idea. And then, of course, there's, with greed, the avert, you know, the avoidance just by going to the, to get the next bag of chips or sweets or whatever and just not snacking. That's a really good rule is avoiding snacking. Um, if you want to just institute that, have your three meals a day, but no snacking. Um, you can all keep snacking if you want, but <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. But our avoidance mechanisms are very interesting and variegated, so... Yeah. Thank you. James or Nastasia? Over here, Miles. Um, Ajahn Nisa Bo, can meditation, particularly sort of <clears throat> focused around techniques, ever become a way of avoidance? As in, we're using it to avoid suffering. Let's take a poll on that one. Everyone who thinks you can use meditation to avoid suffering, yes. <laughs> yeah, great, great question. Um, yeah, we call that spiritual bypass. Um, and yeah, it's very much like we want to jump straight to the fourth noble truth of the path, and that's how I map on the technique to that. And I really see it a lot with metta practice because it's such a romantic, inspirational object like of course I want to just spread loving kindness but you know with anger this is the example I use a lot like the temptations really to try to spread metta to the person you're angry at whereas so often the real need is just to rest in a much more humble and human metta which is just feeling like ow it really hurts to be angry or to feel the bruise of a failure pass through and that bruising of failure like, you know that sense of when you've done something wrong, when you've lashed out when you shouldn't have, or when you've disappointed, when you've embarrassed yourself. It's, it's almost like a bruise that just moves through the body, and there's no way of rushing it. And so I think that's the primacy of the first noble truth, is coming back to that humility of just like, sometimes your whole job in practice is just to keep your head down and let the bruise pass by without reacting. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes a huge amount of restraint. And I really, the issues, we have bright periods of practice where things are going great. And coming out of retreat, many people will have this. And you just want to ride that third and fourth noble truth all the way. I, I always get the image of a, in Dr. Strangelove, the, the guy riding the nuclear bomb down with like his cowboy hat. Okay, I saw that before I ordained. But I... Uh, <laughs> um, but it's like we just want to ride that train and you don't get to, like, if you've had a good meditation or a good week, you can dependently, is that, wait, dependably, you can dependably uh, rely on the fact that the first and second noble truth will come very soon because your heart is strong enough that the Dharma will, will bring that to you. And uh, so often people have the experience of coming out of retreat and then they get slammed and they think it's the issues not that the world is coming at them, but that they haven't reoriented to be with the first and second noble truth. They still want to be in third and fourth noble truth mode. Yeah. And you really have to be agile and switch and be like, okay, this is my chant. This is my oper This is time for the slow boil. That's a good analogy for practice. It's the slow boil, yeah. but it softens you up. So. Yeah, does that ring true? Yes. Okay. And, and I think it's good in practice to have a period in any practice that's just open awareness yeah. and just make space for whatever's there. You can imagine your 
mind as big as this room or gym and just say, what's here right now? And, you know, you're welcome. And that lets there be some room. So, thank you. Yeah, good. James. Hi. So I don't know if this question was asked already, but uh, what does it take to be considered a lay practitioner? And is Buddhism, or do you consider Buddhism a religion? Great question. <laughs> really good question. To start with the religion part, um, Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, and yet that word is loaded um, with our, the Abrahamic religions, valence. And those are called the faiths for a reason, because the primary way of becoming a Christian or a, otherwise is to, is a declaration of faith. You know, uh, for example, in Christianity, often the belief in, in Christ. Um, the core article of Buddhism, and so Ajahn Jayasaro categorizes those in broad strokes, but as systems of belief, whereas uh, Buddhism is a system of education or practice. So the primary element is not, um, there should be, you know, there's kind of a prerequisite belief that we can, our actions have, the ability to change things. And so we have the ability to purify our minds, but it can be at the level of a working hypothesis. And then the key element in Buddhism would be, yeah, practicing, trying to hold the Noble Eightfold Path, meditating, holding good morality. And that's reflected in part of what it takes to kind of, if there was a line to be kind of pointed to as to when you become a, a Buddhist lay practitioner, um, one line that's held up often is taking three refuges. So just taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, which can be the historical Buddha as a teacher, the Dhamma, which are the teachings as he stated them, and the Sangha, which is the, the noble beings, those others who have attained enlightenment. But it can also be internally the quality of the awakened mind or the potential for awakening, the Buddha. The Dhamma is truth. And the Sangha is what happens when that awakened mind knows truth incarnate in a human so ethic, ethics, because the mind that knows truth aligns with reality in a way that is pure. Um, so that's refuge. And then the five precepts are a foundation for many, which is no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, and no taking intoxicants. Um, that being said, there's a ton of Buddhists uh, in Thailand and elsewhere that do not keep those full five, especially that fifth one. So... Um, <laughs> It's funny, you'll hear people be quite loud for the first four and things get kind of quiet for that fifth. Um, so there's not a clear line, but that is a, a helpful metric is, is around there. But it's a, it's a much more gentle entry. Um, it's just like give meditation a try, see how it goes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, last year when you gave that meditation, um, I was staying with a friend to help her with her seizures as she was going through or dying of brain cancer. So I led her through the same meditation. And afterwards, um, she was calm and grateful. And um, I'm grateful to you for leading it. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. It's, uh, it's Ajahn Brahm's guided meditation at the first, but uh, it's, it's the most powerful guided meditation I've ever encountered. Um, we usually end up with someone crying. I don't know if we did this time, but you're in good company if, it, if you did. But yeah, I'm surprised by the sense of, usually there's a lot of luminosity that comes, and sometimes it's not like that. Some people, there's, there's people that they're not ready to let go of, but I'm really glad that it was helpful. Thank you, Ajahn Nisa Bong, for the talk today. Um, I am struggling a lot with like rumination and anxiety and doubt, and that's like been a big source of my dukkha. And I guess I'm just wondering about like 
not running away and distracting and not just like turning so far into the suffering that the rumination is taking over, but finding like the skillful way to turn toward the suffering without getting lost in the cycle of rumination or whatever is happening in the mind. Without getting into territory you're not willing or comfortable sharing with a group of 70 random people. Um, not random, you're not at random, all you people. Uh, is there any more context you can give for this, this kind of subject of the rumination or, or what its general flavor is? generally has to do with decision making, like either having paralysis around making a decision so that feels like anxiety and doubt, or having made a decision that I regret and now I'm ruminating and regret, regretful. And it, it really takes over, wakes me up at night. And like when I wake up in the night, I'm like, okay, just be with this, but then it just goes too far. Yeah, yeah, um, great question. I think there's, the Buddha divided the Noble Eightfold Path into three sections. There's sila, samadhi, panya. That's ethics, uh, which I think can roughly be construed as your external actions and behavior. Samadhi, which is your kind of emotional brightness, and panya, which is wisdom. And so the standard advice you'd get for something like this is, is yeah, look at it with wisdom, see it as the Four Noble Truths, see it as not self, see it as impermanent. You've probably done all these things. Um, and they're useful. And also the Buddha said to look at them in terms of the attraction, the drawback, and the escape. So really noticing what's attractive about that, what's drawing you back to it. Maybe it's the sense of like, if I think it through, I, I won't mess up again. You know, if I really drill it in or I'll be secure. Maybe it's just a familiarity with the mind circling in that way. But just getting a really good feel for the flavor that's drawing you back to it. Um, and... I'd say though the, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot to be said just for labeling. Oh, anxiety, rumination, that can kind of be a, a, a nice little metric as well. Um, there's some other skillful means you can use, like imagine drawing the words on water and letting them just become, the pond become completely calm again and just see if that lets it fade from the mind. That's an Ajahn Jayasaro piece of advice. Um, but the other two aspects of samadhi and sila, it's kind of your external actions and your emotional well-being are really helpful too. Um, so in terms of the samadhi aspect, um, just in meditation, can you channel that movement of the mind in a different realm? So like, instead of just trying to fixate the mind on say one point of the breath, try to circulate it up the spine, down the front of the body, up the spine, down in the front of the body. Just run the energy out like a dog circling its bed until it can lie down, instead of kind of just trying to lie down right away and sort of shivering. Um, and uh, take a cold shower before you meditate. Make sure you're getting exercise. Just move it through the body. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing is to the sila part of like external action and, and behavior in life. Um, just to say there, there are all these really helpful, skillful means you can use as well. Like just making sure you're, you know, if you have these decisions, really just write them down in a notebook. Sometimes your mind doesn't want to forget. So like if you write down the decision clearly, it just lets you put it down for a time. Sleep on something and just think of it when you wake up. Sometimes there's a lot of clarity in the first five minutes after you wake, you have access to your subconscious. Um, run stuff by others for a while. Um, or uh, another useful thing is in meditation, imagine both decisions next to each other and turn your body towards each and see how your body reacts to each orientation, if there's a certain resonance with one. But another thing I'd say is that when the waters in life are choppy, there's this temptation to really want to see farther, like you want to get the whole landscape. And the irony is that when things are choppy, it's the time you're least able to do that. And often your job in those moments of a lot of uncertainty and chaos is to be like the ship captain who's just steering into the next gigantic wave. So ironically and counterintuitively, when things are especially uncertain, it's when you need to stay most in your heart. Like what feels right? What makes me feel strong? 
what feels pure in my intention because I have no idea about the, ver like the multifaceted conditions I'm walking into. The waves are too high. All I know is this is where my rudder needs to be oriented into the next wave. So that's a counterintuitive movement of heart, but that's when you need to remain most in, in your heart. And then the question, instead of what's gonna make me happy, like what's the greatest gift I can give? That's a, that's a good question. Is that helpful at all? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, good, good luck. We should wrap up.